welcome back to another episode of the Open Source Cafe. This is our third session with Sema. We're doing a nice little mentorship series formed around the sort of questions you ask us. So if you want to have more such sessions, ask more good questions. Speaking of asking good questions, that is what we are discussing about today, um, because this is an extremely, extremely important topic. Asking good questions. It will take you a long, long way, and it will solve most of the questions that you ask us. Um, so questions are solved by asking good questions. So we're talking about that today. Um, Matt is joining us again. Hey, Matt, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome back to the channel. Would you like to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself who may not already be familiar with you? Sure, and thanks again, Kunal. It is such a pleasure to talk with you. It is such a pleasure to get see such great questions uh, from folks who follow you. I, I always have always have fun doing this. Uh, so I'm Matt Van Italy. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called SEMA. I live in Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., in the United States. SEMA is focused on building tools to help make code quality better and help developers improve their careers. We're really passionate, I would say obsessed, with making code better and helping engineers learn more uh, and be more successful and, and, and be more fulfilled in their careers. Uh, I've had the good fortune uh, to have had some pretty pretty interesting uh, professional experiences along the way. I coded uh, when I was very little, um, worked uh, in technology in uh, governments, in school districts, uh, in some really great software companies, uh, and put together all of that to build SEMA. We're a global team, 45 of us around the globe, and uh, Incredible energy. I'm so proud of our team and so proud of, of what we're building together. Amazing. Um, and if you want to hear more about you know, more conversations with me and Matt uh, on some great uh, you know, life topics in general and career conversations, um, you can check out the page, comclassroom.org slash SEMA. Listed everything over there. And you can find transcripts uh, as well, uh, blogs to these sessions. Um, you shout out to Matt for you know setting that up. But today we're talking about communication, like best practices. So, why why do good you know communication skills matter? First of all, and this is like an open question for both like students and new you know, juniors, new grads. Why why good communication skills matter, especially now when most of the you know companies are adopting to like remote culture. Sure. Of course, being able to be good at quote, the work uh, matters. Um, becoming a better and better coder uh, or other kind of technologist, uh, of course that matters. Uh, but the further you get in your career, uh, the more important it is to be able to talk about your work and to be able to listen to others and receive communication and act on it. Uh, and even at the earliest stages, uh, the better you are at communicating, the more successful you're going to be. Uh, as you, it's certainly true as you get higher in your career as a manager. It is mainly about communicating, communicating to your team, communicating from your team, communicating up. But even early on, uh, being able to communicate well is uh, is a huge driver of success. And exactly as you said, Kunal. Uh, that was always true, uh, even if everyone was sitting in the same room, being able to communicate together. But now with so much asynchronous communication, remote and distributed communication, uh, the ability to uh, speak, you know, communicate clearly uh, orally and especially in writing uh, has matters, matters more than ever before. Exactly. And um, we'll talk more about async communication later on because the question I've gotten quite a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that later. But uh, um, you mentioned like it has been crucial from the very start. And this is something that they also hint us during like the interviews, for example. So technical interviews or behavioral interviews or whatever, it's a two way street. So it's not like you are the only one speaking. It's, it's like you're communicating with the other person. Matt, I'd love to hear your thoughts because you've done so many interviews, hired your, your entire team is you know, uh, working on this great uh, product, tech team and marketing team and everyone. So the thing is that, you know, during the interview also, they want to hear your like thought process. They want to hear how you, how well you are able to express yourself. 
um, and that's one of the reasons why I recommend students not to be quiet when in an interview. Like when someone gives you a question, think out loud, think your approach, try to you know optimize your solution or whatever. But how how do you think like you know the the interview as well like that ties in with the uh, communication skills and on what basis do people judge like okay because the basically the question is do people can people reject you if you don't have good communication skills is what i'm saying sure the answer to that is definitely yes <laughs> is definitely yes and that is even more important uh now when um you're going to be working in a different location uh in so many uh in, in so many organizations um if you humor me let me talk a little bit about one of Sima's philosophies about communication and how it relates to uh, how it relates to interviews in particular. Uh, one of the things we say at Sema is that our company values matter more than anything else. Second comes communication, and third comes the work. Values matter more than communication, and communication matters more than work. So values uh, is about trust. So if you have shared values, you can really trust someone. If you think about situations at, in a school project or at a job, um, if you can't trust someone that's on your team, uh, it's it's a cancer. It gets in the way of doing anything else. And so if you don't have a baseline level of trust, uh, that that's more important than anything else. Assuming you have the trust, the next most important thing is communication. And in fact, communication for SEMA and many other places is more important than the work. Uh, and here's why. Um, uh, Kunal, you're an, an incredible leader, an incredible coder, an incredible teacher. Um, if you and I were working on a project to build a new curriculum, I would have incredible confidence that your technical skill at building curriculums would be um, uh, is second to none. It's absolutely incredible. If you were hard to talk to, or you were not willing to have a conversation, or you were difficult to get a hold of, you might be doing what you're doing correctly, but you would be veering off course uh, because anything we do as part of a team requires the ability to um, iterate, to learn from each other, to make changes based on the new information. Uh, someone who is great at work, but not great at communication can be put off on an island, uh, so to speak, uh, and then they start separating uh, from the direction. So at SEMA, which I can speak of the best, communication is is a larger requirement uh, than uh, te technical skills. Of course, those matter, uh, but communication is critically important. And so when we're in an interview, we um, we're looking, we're absolutely looking for folks to. Um, uh, to talk to, like you said, to share their thought process, to be um, uh, to show what they would be like to commit to work with at work. It's so I know um, early in my career, interviews are so stressful, and um, you just you're thinking so much about making a good impression. What I know now, um, and not every company is like this, so you know, take it with some grains of salt. But what I know now is you really should behave in an interview as if you were talking with your friends. And the reason for that is you want to be relaxed, you want to be authentic, and you want to show what you are like to work with. Uh, and good organizations uh, celebrate and recognize that this person is going to show me what it's like for us to be working together. And frankly, if they want you to be formal in an interview, even though the place is not formal, that's probably a warning sign. So really try to channel. I'm in this interview. Yes, I'm trying to get a job, but uh, I'm, I'm going to behave like uh, I'm talking to a friend that I've known for years. I agree. And what most people don't realize is that folks want you to succeed during an interview. The people who are taking your interview, they, they want you to succeed. They, they are your future colleague. And if they have if, if they have given you an opportunity, then they definitely want you on the team and you just have to make the most out of the opportunity. Just a follow up on this before I forget, since we're talking about interviews and communication skills. When at the end of the interview, someone asks, do you have any other questions? Uh, <laughs> what 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 
how would one go about that as a candidate? Sure. Assume in every interview, they are going to uh, ask you that question. And so for every interview, do some prep. Uh, if it's important enough for you to have the interview, it's important enough for you to do some research in advance. Uh, and so I would spend 30 to 60 minutes doing some research uh, and coming up with a set of questions that you actually want to know the answer to. Um, it can't, people can tell when you're making, when you have made up questions, you do not want to do that. You can ask about the product roadmap. You can ask about uh, competitors and how they see themselves as different from other folks in the industry. You can and should find their bio uh, and ask them questions about how they made their career choices. Uh, and my favorite question, uh, or favorite set of questions, uh, given how you heard um, how culture really matters to SEMA, um, is I love asking questions about, about culture um, tell me about the cultural values of your team. And I'd love to hear a story or two about uh, where people follow those values and what happened. And also what happened when they didn't follow those values. Um, for values to be run, uh, to be used correctly, there have to be positive consequences if you follow them and negative consequences if you do not. Uh, and that question I love because it's a real indication of what the organization truly values. I agree. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing. And also uh, try not to ask like very like personal questions um, to the interview that you have never met before about like personal life. Some people don't like, like that, like going through their Instagram or whatever before the meeting, not cool. I was, uh, someone told me once about an experience they had and they were like totally freaked out. <laughs> yeah, look right. at um, look at LinkedIn or their bio on their website yeah. or something like that and only ask about questions that are visible on one of those sites. Hmm. Yeah. Um, definitely, you know, if I say on my, I haven't looked in a while, but if my LinkedIn profile said I did uh, improvisational comedy, which I did a long time ago. I don't think it's on my website. Um, you can ask about that, but do not ask me about my children because uh, they are nowhere on, or whether I have children, because that is nowhere on any of my professional sites. Exactly. Couldn't agree more. Awesome. And uh, since, you know, we talked touched upon async communication, so a question I have gotten quite a lot is, um, when working remotely, there are people around the world, right? And then the people, the, the folks were asking me, if you're working for a company in the United States, do you work in the US time zone? Like, do you sleep all day and work all night? Obviously, no. You have to take care of your like health and work in your own hours. But then the follow-up question is like, how do you communicate? So that's the question. How do teams communicate when members are around the world? Sure. So very, very important as you are doing an interview with an organization that is in a different time zone or when staff is in different time zones uh, to be very clear upfront about what are the working times. That is a super professional question. If anyone gives you a hard time about it, you should not take that job because it is incredibly important. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm working, for example, in the India time zone. I observe that the product leadership is in the United States uh, can we please, it's really important for me uh, to really excel at this job. And so I want to make sure uh, I'm setting myself up for success and there's no surprises. Uh, my understanding is that I'm going to work, um, I'll make this up, from nine in the morning, uh, uh, India time to five in the afternoon. Uh, does that work for your organization? And then listen, or... I understand you're in a different country, in a different time zone. I'm prepared to work noon to 10 p.m., whatever that is. Is that, a, you know, that's your preference. Um, is that of interest to you, the organization? But you should know with 100% certainty what time zones they are expecting you to work um, before you accept the job. Um, it's right for you. You deserve to know. 
and it's right for them uh, that there are no surprises. Uh, at our company, um, like I said, global, there are some folks who uh, have adjusted their time zones by a couple hours. We made it very clear upfront uh, that uh, that was part of the job and they had to decide if they wanted to do it or not. Some people like sleeping in uh, and, it, and it worked out well for them. Uh, but for us, we would never ask people to work uh, overnight because it just doesn't overnight their time because it um, it doesn't lead to their best work. We, we, we have ways of working around it. So first principle, absolutely know in advance and do not be surprised coming in that the hours are different from what you were expecting. So that's part one. Part two, in a world where you're going to be working at sometimes on your own or sometimes that's not part uh, of the rest of the team, um, you want to know as clearly as possible what the best practices are with your team uh, for, uh, for communicating with each other. Uh, now, as a junior, uh, what you can do to influence this can only go so far, but I would really recommend asking each person on your team, I'd really like to know, and especially your boss, I'd really like to know uh, how do you like to communicate? When do you like to do, for example, a Slack huddle, a Slack message, an email? When would you like to have a meeting? How should we figure this out? Ask them. Uh, that's a perfectly appropriate question to ask. Uh, for executives, for managers, um, you should do more. You should assert, you should actually write down everyone's preferences. So it seems that we have a document. One of the first things you, you write is, how do I like to communicate? And it's kind of a, uh, not a dictionary, um, it's just a reference guide of every person and what their preferences are. You can't always, uh, you can't always meet them, but you should know. So any managers listening to this, write that document and publish it uh, so that people know what people's preferences are uh, hopefully you can match, um, um, but at least you're knowing when you're overriding, um, you're overriding someone's preference. For us, almost everyone loves Slack as their first method of communicating. Um, I actually prefer email. Uh, I'm a little bit older, that's part of it. But what I really like about email is it serves as a to-do list. Uh, and uh, I really like people to send me individual tasks even if they have 10 different things they want me to do, I don't want one message with 10 things. I want them to send me 10 different messages because then I can check them off. I'm, I do zero inbox and it's much easier. You may not know that. You will not know that about the person you're working with. So figure it out. Ask them how they like to communicate. And if you're a junior, do your best to match to match their preferences because it's going to make, make it more successful. Third point, um, keep working on your writing. <laughs> uh, in asynchronous environments, uh, writing is the key. Uh, and so um, if, if you don't love writing already, you just need to get working on it because um, it's gonna make your lives, uh, make your professional life so much more successful. Uh, a couple tips for that. Um, uh, an expression I like, it's called bottom line upfront or bluff. And the idea is if you are writing someone something to someone, put the bottom, put the primary idea in one sentence at the top of your email uh, rather than at the end. Uh, Kunal, uh, I have three options I would like to run by with you about which curriculum you should build next. Not Kunal, uh, I have some ideas about the Java curriculum and then I have ideas about JavaScript and then COBOL. Just kidding. Uh, I would like your advice on which three of these you do next. Assume that they are going to read it. Uh, actually, it's a real advice. Assume they're going to read your message on a smartphone before they read it uh, in an email and write them um, uh, and write it as if they're going to just read, okay, I have one sentence. Okay, that's what they're asking me about. I got it. So bottom line up front is really important. Another thing sounds may sound a little bit weird, but I really recommend it is don't use pronouns. Don't use pronouns. So why is that? Um, I'll give you an example. Kunal, uh, so Sima uses Jira. Kunal, I have a question about that story that you were working on. What story? We have 
thousands of stories. Like it's incredibly complicated. And even if you think the person knows, sooner or later, they're gonna have to go back and look at it. Um, Kunal, I have a question about East 1136. Uh, and so always being specific, always, always, always being specific uh, helps make the writing right. And then last tip, <laughs> I have a lot to say about communicating, writing effectively. Uh, before you send something, read it out loud. Um, early in our careers and early in perhaps in school or otherwise, we think the fancier words we use when we write, the smarter we are or the more useful it is. The opposite is true. Um, have the confidence to write as clearly as if you were talking. And so literally say it back to yourself, would I actually say this out loud? And if I wouldn't, just write it like that. Couldn't agree more. It's not a letter to the editor that you have to be, uh, you know. Uh, I, I I definitely relate to that. We have been told, you know, when we were in high school and we were learning about letter formats, this is how you should email um, your boss and your colleagues. This is how you, they literally had templates for us and stuff. I was like, okay, cool. So I was like, you know, 14, 15 years old, we learned about those templates. And now in reality, when I talk to like even CEOs, I'm like, hey, How's it going? See ya, smiley. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's a, it's a really opposite. Exactly. Indeed. Exactly. And uh, you mentioned about asking good questions. Uh, an example for that can be some folks, when they're communicating, they just ask questions like, they say hi, and that's it. Nothing else. On Slack or on Twitter, when someone reaches out to you, they're just like, hi, how are you? And that person is like 10, 10 hour time zone difference. They'll see it after 10 hours, maybe 14 hours or whatever. Then they'll reply back or maybe not. Hi, I'm good. And then now one day has passed and your query is still not resolved. So let's answer in th this in two parts. First is when you're communicating. Uh, so communication best practices. When you're communicating with like a stranger in like the community, looking for help or just connecting with people as such, like me and you connected. Or, and the second part is when you're, connecting with your coworker, asking a more technical question. Um, how would you frame these two questions? Yeah. Sure. You should say, hi, how are you? When you want to know how they are. Um, uh, and only that, uh, sometimes you may do that. You may have friends or coworkers you're wondering about in that situation saying, hi, how are you, is perfectly appropriate. In every other situation, say the thing that uh, you actually want. Um, so again, if we were talking together uh, synchronously, so we were actually um, talking, talking uh, like this, Kunal, how's it going? How's your day? Okay, great, because we're gonna have a minute and then I know that a minute later we're gonna get to the real thing. Uh, in asynchronous, in any written communication, skip that step uh, or include it. Kunal, I hope you're well. I need your advice on these three options. Uh, do not have an extra step for exactly the reason that you said. If the person's online or not, it, it's gonna slow down the communication and it's gonna give them, um, it's gonna give them something to do that doesn't really matter. Um, it's, everyone knows that you're working together to achieve a goal. Um, just go ahead with it. Um, because, you know, if you wrote me, you know, people, I didn't know this. If you wrote me, Hey Matt, how, if you wrote me, Hey Matt, how are you? I actually might think, I wonder what he wants. Uh, do I owe him something? Am I in trouble? Like it's, it's weird. It's, 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 it's com asynchronous communication is really different. I know you mean well, not you. When someone does it, you mean well, but skip that step because it then it just gives them something to react to and they don't have context. Kunal, I hope you had a great weekend. I need these three things from you. Like that, jump immediately to, don't have two separate messages. So that, so that is one part. So, um, and, and getting, let me answer this and you can come back to the, to the other parts. Um, communicating on something um, as part of a community, let's say as part of a team, um, uh, we actually, right before this, we're talking about having empathy for your audience and how important it is to have empathy for your audience. Um, empathy for your audience is uh, is also really important in communicating even on projects. And one of the tips, um, one of the tips I really uh, recommend 
is to write your messages that make it as easy as possible for the audience to respond in five, let's say 10 characters or less. Not 10 words, 10 characters. And the best method, especially if you're communicating to your boss, uh, who is very busy and has many things to worry about, is to enable them to respond in three characters or less. So you wonder, how could that be possible? Uh, Kunal, um, as you requested, boss, don't say boss, but he was a boss in this situation, um, I have put together three proposals for which curriculum we should go after next. Please reply A, if you think I should build Java, B, if you think I should reply, if I should build JavaScript and C should be COBOL, detail on each of these options is below. So you have now set it up like a multiple choice question. Um, and uh, you've started with the bottom line. I need you to pick one of these. And I've made it so that all you need to write back is A, B, or C. Uh, and, um, uh, and that it just makes it so much easier because you can do it. From a smartphone, you can say, okay, A is the answer, or I want to talk about it, or something like this. Earlier in my career, if I had heard it, when I heard advice like this, I thought, that is so insulting. Oh, what am I, is my boss an idiot? Like, of course, uh, of course my boss can take this information and handle it and respond. Don't think like that. That's wrong. <laughs> think, oh my goodness. I can only imagine how many things my boss has on his plate or her plate or their plate. I'm going to just make it easier, make one thing easier for them because they already have to think about what I'm trying to say. So let me, let me not add an extra step of making them write a lot about it. Making your uh, boss's life easier and your colleagues' lives easier through communication that makes it easier for them to respond is so helpful. Uh, it, it just goes a long way uh, to being a great teammate and a, a great team member. Thanks for sharing, Mark, and thanks for sharing your, your, your experiences as well. I have actually gotten emails like that um, after, after KubeCon. So what happens at KubeCon, um, you have so many sponsors and they have your email, they send you marketing stuff and so on and stuff, so on and so forth. So they're like, hey, yeah, this product, you want to try it out. Then you don't reply, then they'll just send you three options. Hey, the first option is, yeah, sure, I'd love to try, or I can book a meeting. I'm not, I'm occupied right now, or I don't just care. And they just literally write that. <laughs> so I think like it's good to be straightforward and it saves a lot of time. Um, I think like that is a great, uh, great option. Cool. And uh, speaking of about, no, speaking about like, let's talk about feedback now. So before we talk about some, of the good practices and you know and stuff and we talk about giving and receiving feedback can you tell us a little bit more about you know you mentioned earlier how it's very important for a junior to you know look for feedback and how it can help them grow sure so when it comes to career advancement when it comes to looking for new opportunities, whether it's in your organization or another one, what you do and how successful you are in actually doing the work is sometimes uh, as important and sometimes even less important than the subjective opinion uh, of other people around you. And uh, what follows from that, that's, that, it's not fair, uh, but it is definitely true. And I believe in giving career advice based on what's true, uh, not what might be fair. And so understanding what people think about what you are doing is incredibly important to uh, know how they're going to view you and how they might view potential advancement. So that's kind of a, maybe a transactional reason, but it's also, incredibly important to uh, get better at what you're doing. Uh, I highly, highly recommend um, maintaining an incredible sense of curiosity about how you can improve and learn from every person around you. I, I actually learned this when I was a, a very young man. I used to play the double bass, um, that large instrument larger than a cello. I was very bad at it. 
Um, but I had the advantage of having a bass and a car that was big enough to have it. So I got to play in orchestras that were way better. Violinists, incredibly hard uh, to get into orchestras. Because I had a bass and could drive it around, I got to play in a lot of them. And I remember uh, I was in high school and playing with uh, a bassist who was extremely good. And the two of us were in this, this orchestra together. And I knew I wasn't very good at it. And I, I remember saying to her, why? What am I doing here? <laughs> like, what? why am I playing next to you? You're so much better than me. And she said, I, I can learn from everyone. Every single person I meet can teach me something. Uh, and that idea, I get goosebumps thinking about it, uh, has stuck with me forever. And whether it's a boss, a colleague, a customer, um, friends, you can learn from everyone. And the moment you think you already know all the answers, you've stopped the ability to grow even more than what you have right now. So maintaining a sense of curiosity and going out of your way to get feedback, but not in an annoying way, we'll talk about that, uh, is I think it's a way to advance your career, it's a way to advance your skills, and it's a way to to just be engaged in the world, for the world to be much more interesting. Couldn't agree more. Thanks a lot for sharing, uh, Matt. And uh, I definitely, it, it will help you grow and uh, you'll learn about you know what where you are lacking, um, for example. So you won't know what you're missing out on unless you ask good questions. And we already covered that. Speaking of giving and receiving feedback, let's talk about, you know, first of all, let's talk about um, the good, good kind of stuff. So like giving people shout outs. Um, I, I love to hear your views on it, but when, when working in teams and stuff, I like to give shout outs like in public, uh, other team members will be able to see. And when it comes to like giving criticism, I give that privately um, with some action items, obviously like constructive uh, criticism. So what are some of your best practices? Let's start with um, the good one. So like how do you give and receive um, you know, shout outs and good feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's one thing that's that's really important that I want to say first, which is um, advice I give to juniors about uh, giving feedback, uh, positive and negative, uh, is different from advice I would give to uh, mids or seniors, and especially managers or managers of managers. And as a junior, you may observe that your organization is not great at dealing with feedback. Um, it's really hard to do right. There's lots of reasons why. You may observe that it could be better. Uh, you have very little power, um, uh, almost no power, uh, to modify um, uh, that culture of feedback. So uh, there are great resources on how teams can run systems of feedback. Um, uh, but you, in your individual capacity, uh, need to match yourself to how the feedback system works at your organization. Um, because some places, which is incredibly sad, but it is it's frankly not that uncommon, not that uncommon, that um, trying to give or receive feedback is a bad thing for you if it's outside of the way that your of your organization works. So that that's really important for juniors, uh, seniors, managers. If you want advice on how you should set up feedback for your team, write me. I have written a lot about this. I have great templates. Do do right for your team. But juniors, follow along. So with all that, that's very important. Uh, step one: uh, when you get to a place, watch. Uh, watch all of the communication you can for at least a week, uh, perhaps even two weeks. Folks who've heard me talk when we we did a discussion about open source. It's the same thing for potentially being a contributor. You want to soak in how the place works already so you can understand the ebbs and the flows, the way that people talk, almost the dialect of this community so that you understand uh, the norms from the way that people behave. Uh, once you've done that, we can go to step two. Kunal, you're exactly right. Positive feedback can be... Uh, can and should be in almost all circumstances, unless your organization is different, should be in public channels. Um, uh, while private, while uh, constructive feedback should be in private channels. 
um, never, ever, ever assume that an organization or a person can handle negative news publicly, no matter if they say, oh, I'm always open to feedback. Never trust someone <laughs> on that. Uh, do it privately, uh, privately at first and until they really make sure it's okay. Um, we talk about, and so public versus private. In all circumstances, in all circumstances, try to make your feedback as specific as possible. And Kinal, you mentioned it for your negative feedback. Uh, it's really important um, to give a, you know, here's what you should do differently or, or some specifics. I really encourage you to, um, uh, I really encourage you to make your positive feedback as specific because it's much more memorable and it's much more impactful than just a general statement. Uh, one of my favorite stories on this, uh, I went to visit one of my uh, current colleagues, an, an amazing human being, and he shared feedback with me after my visit and said, you know, Matt, I think you're a great communicator. It's really nice. Uh, it was really nice of him to say. I actually said, what do you mean? Uh, or can you give me a specific example? And he said, yeah. Um, after we had our work meeting, my parents stopped by and you spent an hour drinking a cup of tea uh, with them and talking with them and listening to them. And I was really touched by that. That is such a very particular uh, a particular example of what good communication means, it's so much more memorable when you can give it to them at that level. We know, we've learned that negative feedback should be specific so you're not stressing them out and trying to be general, but with being general, but positive should be that, feed, that specific too. Amazing. Thanks for covering like both the points about like good feedback and like the criticism uh, part as well extremely important to have like some action items associated with it that's what makes it you know um constructive um cool so oftentimes folks are like um this is not this we uh, this this video is not good okay fine what what did you not like about it what can we do to improve for example so share action items uh, that will help the other person grow as well Awesome. Well, we are about time. And uh, thanks for joining, Matt. It was great. Um, uh, always a pleasure talking to you. We're looking forward to more, more such streams. We answered so many uh, amazing questions. And uh, you can find this uh, on our channel, on the website. We'll be sharing it everywhere. We'll be sharing the blog uh, on the website uh, as well. And the previous sessions you can find in the description below. And yeah, it was great. Amazing. Thanks, Matt. Uh, no, it was really my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. And, and have a great day.